Welcome, fellow explorers, to another episode of our speculative evolution journey. In the last episode, we discussed the multitude of islands on Verdantara. Today, our expedition takes us into the complex social adaptations that have evolved on Verdantara. Up until now we have mainly discussed physical adaptations on Verdantara, but in this episode we will delve into the complex behavioral adaptations Verdantara's inhabitants may undergo. Social behaviors provide a number of advantages, with one such advantage being easier access to mates. Sexual selection is an event in which traits evolve based on their role in mating. This often leads to sexual dimorphism in which the two sexes exhibit different characteristics. One example of sexual dimorphism is the presence of extravagant colors or structures. Most commonly males use these structures to advertise their fitness to potential mates. On Xyrophilios one clade of Arpazontas may evolve bright coloration and extravagant displays on their hands. These displays are likely derived from the sensory whiskers of their freshwater ancestors. But these displays pose a problem. The males of this species will be easier to pick out against the foliage putting them at greater risk of predation. However, the males that survive to breed would be only the fittest individuals, with the weaker ones becoming prey. This incentivizes the females to mate with the males that exhibit the most extravagant displays. However, these displays do no good if there aren't any females to observe them. Sound is an extremely important adaptation for many reasons. One such reason is to advertise a creature's position to potential mates. Therefore, these creatures may evolve expanded respiratory cavities to amplify their sound, which they create by pushing air out of the body. However, these sounds will do no good if they can't be heard. The ancestral Serpentopodia position tiny vibration-sensitive hairs in cavities connected to the respiratory system, thus allowing them to hear on land. These arpazontas may enlarge these cavities, giving them a more acute sense of hearing. We will call this clade the photonozontas, their echoing calls filling the forests with life. In Xyrophilios open step descendants of the Fidelopodia have evolved herding behaviors. Herding is a useful adaptation as it provides safety in numbers. The young of these creatures will join the herd after hatching. If any danger approaches, the young will be positioned in the center of the group. These creatures sport a fascinating color pattern. Similar to zebras on earth these creatures use their stripes to disorient threats. We will call these herding herbivores the Syncomopoda, they grow up to 6 feet long and live for up to 27 years. One form of behavioral adaptation that is bound to be widespread is parasitism which is a form of symbiosis. The parasite infiltrates a host and leeches energy from them. Parasites tend toward smaller sizes which makes them harder to detect. The hexoforms are prime candidates for parasitism due to their small size. Some hexoforms may adapt to lay their eggs on the skin of other organisms. Once the young hatch, they will dig into the host's flesh, creating a large wound which may lead to infection. We'll call these unnerving parasites the carcizoi, they grow up to 5 cm and live for up to 3 years. As the carcizoi spread descendants of the pinotope may take notice. These creatures may use their beaks to extract the carcizoi and their eggs. They may also feed on other small prey in the grass. However, while feeding they may be open to predation. They may resolve this issue by forming flocks of up to 20 individuals. This behavior provides safety in numbers, plus more eyes makes it easier to spot danger. Once a member of the flock spots danger, they will need a way of alerting the others. Birds on Earth use an organ called a syrinx located where the trachea splits, connecting to the two lungs. In some birds each side of the syrinx can be controlled independently, allowing birds to produce two different pitches at once. 
All descendants of the aquilopods have lungs that are not connected like ours and instead have two openings near the beak. These pinotopes may evolve specialized muscles near the respiratory openings allowing them to create high-pitched chirps. These creatures will also need a hearing system. The aquilopods had an opening near the front of the skull which led to a chamber filled with sensory hairs. When they wanted to hone in on a sound, they would simply turn their bodies. In these pinotopes the hearing chamber may be enlarged giving them a more acute sense of hearing. We will call these chirping pinotopes the carcanaped. They grow up to a foot long and live for up to 15 years. In the deserts of Xyrophilios relatives of the Syncomopoda have evolved an interesting social strategy. When it comes to dispersal, life in the desert encounters a challenge. Most often, the young of a species can't travel far enough to find food. Creatures like the Komonichi solve this problem by keeping the young in the burrow until they are old enough to create burrows of their own. However, these organisms may take a different approach. Case selection is when animals tend to produce less offspring but put more care into those offspring. These creatures may produce only one child and putting all their resources into that child. But they can't just wait for the offspring to mature, so they may evolve to carry their children on their backs. This will allow them to search for food and water while keeping their child safe. At first, the pair only travel at night, but as the child matures, they may travel in the day more often. The mothers will be the ones that exhibit this behavior, staying with their child for about two years. We will call them the matropede. On the continent of Xyranthia social adaptations may also evolve. Descendants of the Natharios have evolved herding behaviors similar to the Syncomopoda. They congregate in herds of up to 500 individuals, traversing the steppe of Xyranthia. They have become larger and stockier, greatly reducing their speed although they are capable of extreme bursts of speed. Unlike the Syncomopoda, which leave their young several hours after birth, these creatures keep their young close for about a year. We will call these prolific creatures the Omeditrophopard, they grow up to 5 feet tall and live for up to 30 years. Social adaptations can benefit predators too. Pack hunting is an event in which multiple predators work together to bring down prey. The main advent of pack hunting is that it allows a group to take down prey that is much too large for a single animal to subdue. But this means less food because the kill must be divided between each individual. The Omeditrophopard may be too well defended by their herds for one individual to take down, so descendants of the Scantopelma may congregate in packs of up to five individuals. They hunt by first isolating an individual, once this is accomplished the rest of the pack will move in for the kill. We will call these hunters the Kinolopoda, they grow up to 3 feet tall and live for up to 27 years. Similarly to the Photonozontas, relatives of the Omeditrophopard may use sociality to aid in reproduction. Lecking is a mating strategy in which the males of a species gather and compete for the right to mate. Lecking is strongly correlated with sexual dimorphism similar to the photonozontas. These omeditrophopards may evolve extravagant coloration on their beaks, along with a unique shape. However, these displays do no good if the females can't locate them. These creatures will use sound to guide the females to them. They may create sound by sharply exhaling. Muscles by their respiratory opening may be used to purse the openings creating a high-pitched whistle sound. The females will be drawn to the males with the loudest calls. Outside of the breeding season these creatures may live in small groups, only congregating to put on their displays. We will call these creatures the keratopard, they grow up to 3 feet tall and live for up to 31 years. But there is another way to secure mating access. 
Harems are groups of individuals typically consisting of a dominant male and multiple females. The harem stays together throughout the year. This ensures that the dominant male has access to mates. Relatives of the dentropod may adapt for a haremic lifestyle. This may prompt some physical changes. Since the harem represents the dominant male's access to mates, he will need to defend it from rivals. If a male is not fit enough to acquire a harem of his own, he may engage in a behavior known as kleptogamy, in which a male secretly mates with females while the dominant male is distracted. Other males may challenge the dominant male for control of the harem. This results in a high amount of sexual dimorphism in haremic species. The males may become larger and stronger equipped with large horns. These horns can be used as defense and as weapons, however the males won't want to risk injury and will try to simply intimidate their opponent, although in the most extreme of cases these fights may result in death. Along with their horns, they may also employ sound. Their respiratory tubes may evolve several chambers amplifying the sound allowing them to produce low growls. We will call these aggressive species the Arsenrio, they grow up to 7 feet tall and live for up to 35 years. In the oceans, some species related to the Serpenticeptoros have adopted a parasitic lifestyle. This may begin with these creatures using other organisms for transportation, which is known as pheresis. However, as they continue to rely on this mechanism for dispersal, some may begin to use their hosts for feeding as well. Hematophagy is a behavior in which organisms get at least part of their diet from the blood of other creatures. Obligate hematophages are creatures that only feed on blood. They use their pincers to tear open the host flesh and then excrete chemicals to prevent the blood from clotting. We will call these creatures clediragas. They can grow up to 5 cm in length and live for up to a year. Our last stop is the continent of Xeracor. A particular branch of polypods may undergo an evolutionary process that leads to the development of parasitic behaviors, similar to those of Clediragas. These creatures will feed on blood, and their beaks will undergo a transformation, evolving to pry open flesh and hook onto the inside of their host's body. As they are feeding, they will release a sticky substance that makes them extremely difficult to remove. These parasitic barnacle-like organisms will be called the Stephanascan. They grow up to 8 cm in length and live for up to 8 years. In the driest parts of Xeracor, a clade of polypods may evolve burrowing behaviors. This will keep them cool and safe from large predators. Groups of up to 15 individuals may co-inhabit one burrow at the same time. Polypods living in a burrow may develop a unique parental system over time if they are closely related to each other. This is because they can all benefit from keeping each other's young alive. The idea behind this is known as inclusive fitness, which suggests that an animal's reproductive fitness is not only based on their own offspring but also on the closely related offspring. In other words, the more closely related the offspring are to the other members of the burrow, the more likely they are to receive care and protection from them. This inclusive behavior may lead to cooperative breeding, in which all individuals at the burrow take part in caring for the offspring. This type of breeding system is characterized by the presence of multiple breeding adults, often closely related, who work together to provide care for the young. The benefits of cooperative breeding include increased survival rates for the offspring, as well as the opportunity for the breeding adults to share the costs and responsibilities of raising young. Some offspring may never leave their burrow and instead help raise new offspring. The females may live longer and produce multiple batches of young. The helpers can even find food, protect the burrow, and make it bigger. Usually, the young stay with their mother for a year or two after they grow up. 
However, some may not reproduce at all and instead help their mother reproduce. Reproductive suppression is when an organism is prevented or prohibited from reproducing. The ultimate example of these behaviors is facultative eusociality. In this behavior, numerous generations of offspring all help the breeding pair. When the dominant male or female dies, a helper will take their place and continue to help the colony survive. Castes are physical and behavioral characteristics that correlate with an individual's role in the colony. Some helpers may become smaller to help gather food and expand the burrow, while others may become larger with stronger pincers to defend the colony. The queen may have enlarged reproductive organs, allowing them to produce large numbers of eggs. These creatures need a form of communication to alert others of danger and food. They may achieve this by evolving specialized chambers, which they vibrate to produce chirping sounds. These creatures here using a specialized organ hidden underneath their shell, which is common to all descendants of the quadrupod. Once these astonishingly complex organisms evolve, they may spread across Xeracore. For the sake of this discussion, we will refer to them as the Mizopod. These are only a select few of the thousands of social adaptations that may emerge on Verdantara. For millions of years, the continents of Xyrophilios and Xyranthia have existed and evolved separately, but in the next episode, we will discuss the biological upheaval that occurs when the two continents finally meet. A huge thank you to all the artists on Discord who made fan art for this episode, you make these videos look so much better. If you want to join the Discord server, the link will be in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share your thoughts on these incredible creatures. Episode 15 will be the final episode of Season 1 of our explorations of Verdantara. But don't worry, something extraordinary is coming in the temporary absence of Verdantara. See you in the next episode.